We concluded last video with um, by pointing out two limitations of what we might possibly be able to prove uh, about longest chain consensus. Uh, limitation number one, uh, we argued we were doomed uh, unless we have a strict majority of honest nodes. So we're going to be thinking about, at minimum, we have something like 51% of the nodes honest and most 49% Byzantine. Limitation number two is we noticed that it's very easy for just a, a, a couple of dishonest leaders in a row uh, to mess around and change the end of the longest chain. So it seemed clear that we should not consider the last few blocks of the longest chain uh, to be confirmed. They, are, they should be regarded as still under negotiation. So what then would be the, the coolest thing that might be true? What is the strongest statement we could try to prove? We could try to prove that as long as you have at least 51% honest nodes, uh, then in fact, uh, the blocks in the longest chain, except for the last few, uh, can in fact be regarded as finalized, will never in fact be rolled back later. And I've got good news. This is exactly what we're going to be proving over the next few videos. We will, of course, have to work out exactly how big K needs to be, um, but there will be a K such that we actually get this finality property. All right, so let's, let's give some notation to this idea of the blocks on a longest chain except for the last K. Let's call that B sub K of G, where G just corresponds to the current entry, all of the blocks that are currently known. So for example, if we set k equal to 2 and look at this orange entry on the right part of this slide, um, well then b sub 2 of that particular entry would just be the, the genesis block uh, and the second of the two blocks that extend it. So a couple possible points of confusion. So, so number one, this parameter k telling you sort of how many blocks at the end of the longest chain you should consider still under negotiation, um, that parameter k, that's not part of the protocol description. Right, so remember the description of longest chain protocol, this, you, just, you have this entry, you know, nodes are elected as leaders, they add a new block uh, and grow the entry by one additional node. Right? Nothing in that protocol description references a parameter k. Rather, the parameter k, it's really about how to interpret the entry that's grown uh, over the course of the longest chain consensus protocol. It's really, frankly, sort of in the eye of the beholder, right? So as, as a user of the blockchain, you can kind of pick your own K and decide how large a prefix of the longest chain you want to consider finalized, right? So for example, you know, if you sell someone a cup of coffee, you know, maybe you're totally comfortable, you know, taking K equal to three because you don't care that much if it gets rolled back at some point. Whereas if you're selling someone a Tesla, maybe you wait until maybe you take K equal to 100. <laughs> so you will wait for 100 extensions of the longest chain before you let the customer drive off with the Tesla, because you want to be absolutely sure it's never going to be rolled back. The second point of confusion, which, you know, frankly, you should be wondering about, is you should be asking whether, you know, B, K, B sub K of G uh, is actually well defined. Right, I've told you that the way you get B sub K of G is you take, the, you take a longest chain and you lop off the last K blocks. The problem is you may have more than one longest chain. Okay, and so if you start from different longest chains and lop off the last K blocks, you might conceivably get different things. So for example, in the second uh, entry uh, on the bottom right part of the slide, uh, B1 of G would not be well defined for that particular entry, right? There's two longest chains. I mean, even if you lop off the last block of each, you still wind up with different things. So that's what I mean by B sub K of G potentially not being well defined. The hope then, and indeed what our first theorem is going to be, is that as long as you have at least 51% honest nodes, then in fact, as long as you pick K sufficiently large, B sub K of G actually is well-defined. Okay, so there may be sort of multiple longest chains, but the different longest chains are gonna wind up disagreeing only in their final K blocks. So if you take two different longest chains, throw out their last K blocks, you actually get the same thing. So all longest chains have a shared common prefix uh, which extends all the way up to the last k blocks on each of the chains. So really there's sort of three different things we want to prove about longest chain consensus and I'll, I'll state the, these guarantees all on the next slide. Um, so we want to prove this you know common prefix property so b sub k of g actually is well defined all longest chains agree with each other except possibly for their last k blocks. We want to prove finality so we want to prove that once um, you know, a block is considered firm, confirmed, that is, once it has been extended k times on the longest chain. Uh, in fact, it won't ever be rolled back at any point in the future. Uh, and we want to prove liveness. We want to prove that, um, you know, eventually transactions um, get added uh, to a block that's confirmed, to a finalized block. Now, all three of those results are only going to be true under our standing assumption that at least 51% of the nodes are honest. So you should be asking yourself, okay, how, how is that hypothesis going to enter into the proofs of these three guarantees? 
So I want to make the analysis as modular as possible. So what I'm going to do is on the second half of this slide, uh, I'm going to state a definition, okay, a property that a sequence of leaders may or may not have. And then we're going to show that this is a sufficient condition for all three things that we want, the common prefix property, uh, the sort of finality property, uh, and liveness. Then, having established that the sufficient condition I'm about to write down gives us everything that we want, and then we turn our attention to understanding when is that sufficient condition actually going to hold. And that will be the part of the proof where we use the fact that we have at least 51% honest nodes. The sufficient condition I'm going to write down on this slide, there is like literally no hope this would ever be true uh, if, you did not, if you did not have a majority honest nodes. Before I state the, the formal definition, let me just remind you that we actually foreshadowed this definition toward the end of the, the last video. Right, what we saw there is that an obstruction uh, to being able to finalize blocks would be sort of sequences of leaders where the number of dishonest leaders uh, is bigger than the number of honest leaders. Whenever you have a window with more dishonest than honest, they're in a position to actually cancel some of the blocks at the end of the longest chain. So presumably key to the analysis is going to be the property that that doesn't happen. <laughs> that as long as you look at a long enough sequence of leaders, in fact, there's going to be more honest leaders than dishonest leaders. And that's exactly what this definition is going to capture. So we're going to want to consider a sequence of A's and H's. So here A just means some round in which a Byzantine node is chosen as the leader, and H just means some round in which an honest node is a leader. Notice, you know, in analyzing the behavior of the longest chain consensus protocol, we, we don't have to differentiate between nodes other than whether or not they're honest or adversarial. Otherwise, we really don't care. All honest nodes are acting exactly the same way. They're just following the protocol. They're just extending a longest chain. Different honest nodes might tie break differently from each other, but we're assuming nothing about tie breaking, so that doesn't matter. Adversarial nodes, remember, Byzantine nodes we always assume are conspiring against us anyways. So it really doesn't matter if it's just the same Byzantine node over and over again, or if you're sort of cycling through a bunch of different ones, the behavior is exactly the same. So we're gonna call such a sequence W balanced. Here W is a parameter, the W is meant to stand for window. And the condition states that for every window of length at least W, okay, so for every uh, at least W consecutive rounds, it should be the case that a strict majority of the leaders chosen in those rounds are honest. Now what's of interest to us is to identify the smallest value of this parameter W such that the leader sequences we're interested in are going to wind up being W balanced. Right, we're certainly not going to get that for like W equals 1, because even if you have a single Byzantine leader ever, right, that's going to be an A. That's going to be a length 1 window where you have 0% honest nodes. Okay, so you're not going to satisfy this condition. Same thing, W equals 2. As soon as you have one adversarial node, you have a length 2 window uh, with a 50-50 split of honest and dishonest. But there's definitely still hope of if at least 51% of the overall nodes are honest, um, perhaps we're W balanced for W sufficiently large. I mean, indeed, notice that if somehow honest nodes were like perfectly evenly represented in this leader sequence, then we'd actually be fine, right? So suppose there's 51% honest nodes. If you considered any sort of window of length 1,000, you would be expecting 510 of the 1,000 to be honest, a strict majority. That would be if honest nodes were perfectly evenly represented in this sequence. So that's the definition of a W-balanced uh, leader sequence. This is going to be a very important definition for us uh, for the rest of Lecture 8. And what we saw at the end of the last video is that, you know, if you're running longest chain consensus and the sequence of leaders that you're seeing does not satisfy this condition, is not W-balanced, uh, then you've got problems, right? Because that means in sort of big windows, you're actually seeing more dishonest leaders than honest leaders we saw last video that whenever that happens, the dishonest leaders can cancel some number of blocks off of the longest chain, meaning you wouldn't be safe to finalize uh, those blocks. So it's not at all obvious what we have to prove and will prove over the coming slides is that the converse is also true. Okay, so it's not just that we're screwed if we don't satisfy the definition, it's also that we're good if we do satisfy the definition. So if we can generate a sequence of leaders that's W balanced for reasonable W, uh, then we will get everything we want. The common prefix property, uh, f finality properties, uh, and liveness. 
So let's go ahead and state those three guarantees formally. So on this slide, we'll be assuming that the definition on the previous slide holds, that we're W balanced for a reasonable value of W, and we will be concluding everything we want, the common prefix property, uh, finality, and liveness. Now, to really capture the essence of these arguments in the simplest way possible, uh, I'm going to make an assumption. It's going to seem strong. It's actually not that strong. But this is going to make our lives easier if we assume we're in what I'm going to call the supersynchronous model. And what I mean by supersynchronous is it's going to be literally zero message delay. Okay, so this is like the synchronous model with the delta, the maximum delay bound, equal to zero. So as soon as an honest node speaks, and that at exact instant, all the other nodes will hear about. It. Now, just as a warning, supersynchronous, that's not a standard term. I totally just made that up for this lecture. Uh, but what I mean is instant message delivery. So delta equals zero in the synchronous model. Now, I totally appreciate this assumption might really uh, bother you, especially given, you know, the lectures leading up to this one, right? Because at the beginning, when I introduced the state machine replication problem, I said the goal was to keep various sort of machines in sync with each other. Um, and the reason they might be out of sync, right, is because of message delays. So by virtue of having all the honest nodes be able to instantly communicate all the information they know to all the other, other honest nodes, haven't we sort of trivialized consistency? Isn't it kind of like automatic that all of the honest nodes uh, will sort of be, have exactly the same local history? So the short answer is yes. I mean, it is the case that all honest nodes will now have exactly identical information. So they'll all know about the same entry. They'll all have the same view uh, of the blockchain. However, there's really two types of consistency, right? There's consistency across different machines. So that's the type that we've trivialized in the supersynchronous model. But consistency should also mean consistency with your future self, okay? in the sense that whatever sort of you believe is confirmed now, your future self should also believe that all of those transactions are confirmed. Now, in all of our discussions of state machine replication protocols, we kind of didn't have to make this explicit because we just said that each node maintains an append-only local history. And so by calling it append only, we are sort of by definition only allowing things to be added. Things can never be rolled back. With longest chain protocols, on the other hand, we know that we do have to worry about blocks potentially being rolled back, especially if we're too eager to confirm them. And this second type of consistency, consistency with one's future self, that is not at all trivialized by the supersynchronous assumption. And so just to make it clear, like which type of consistency I'm talking about at a given time, if I mean this self-consistency, consistency with one's future self, like you never roll back transactions, I'll refer to that property as finality. So I have three defenses for introducing this seemingly unrealistic supersynchronous model. Uh, so first of all, all of the guarantees that I mentioned on the, on the last slide that we want to prove. So uh, common prefix property and uh, finality and liveness, none of those are trivial in the supersynchronous model. Those are all going to require some work. My second defense is that, you know, not only are the proofs non-trivial, but uh, somehow in the supersynchronous model, you know, we reduce clutter that would otherwise obscure the essential ideas and the arguments. So in the supersynchronous model, it's easiest to see fundamentally why these guarantees really are true. My final defense is that um, it doesn't really matter in the sense that basically the same results hold in the sort of usual synchronous model where there's some non-zero maximum message delay delta uh, known in advance to the protocol. These extensions to the synchronous model, they're not, they're not trivial. Um, I mean, they are a good homework exercise if you have a little time. Um, if you've made it through this far in the lecture series, you're certainly capable of, of sort of understanding and working through um, these extensions. Let me also write on the slide a couple uh, research papers which include those details in case you're interested. So the main issue that comes up in extending these results to the synchronous model is that um, in addition to the sort of deliberate forking by Byzantine nodes uh, that we're going to be concerned with, um, because there's now non-zero message delays, you also sometimes have inadvertent forks caused just by honest nodes, because basically, you know, one of them didn't hear about the other one's block um, before it proposed its own block. In effect, this means you have these sort of occasional periods where um, one honest block accidentally cancels out another one. So in the analysis, you basically have to argue that that doesn't happen very much. And as a result, it doesn't really change um, the basic analysis we're going to do in the supersynchronous model. 
And it turns out, and I think it's also kind of intuitive, um, that this will happen rarely. Only rarely will sort of two different honest blocks be produced at roughly the same time. Um, as long as the rate of block production is slow relative to the maximum message delay. So, for example, you know, in Bitcoin, you might say, OK, the maximum message delay under normal operating conditions is at most, let's say, 10 seconds, which is pretty generous. Um, and it turns out because Bitcoin blocks are only generated once every 10 minutes, uh, the probability that a block is generated in a 10 second window is less than 2 percent. So that's what I mean by the rate of block production being slow relative to the maximum message delay. All right, so that's all I want to say about the synchronous model. So from now on, we'll proceed in the super synchronous model. Just know that for longest chain consensus, the super synchronous model is actually a really good proxy for the real results in the normal synchronous model uh, with non-zero message delays. All right, so here's the main result. So we are going to assume that the definition, the condition on the last slide holds. We're going to assume that somehow we've produced a sequence of leaders that is W balanced for a reasonable value of W. So the first consequence of balancedness is going to be the common prefix property. So this means that you know, our notation B sub K of G uh, is well defined. So formally, we're going to be considering a leader sequence, which is 2K balanced. Uh, so the parameter W here, we're setting equal to 2K. Uh, now we want to consider every possible sequence of entries that could possibly arise given this, um, given this leader sequence. In other words, we're going to be ranging over all possible choices that the chosen Byzantine nodes and chosen honest nodes in the sequence might make. Now, the Byzantine nodes, as we've discussed, can do a lot of different things. So, for example, they can extend blocks that are not the end of the longest chain. Um, even the honest nodes do have some flexibility because we're allowing them to break ties between um, different longest chains arbitrarily. So when I say for any possible sort of sequence of entries we might see, I mean no matter what the Byzantine nodes do and no matter how the honest nodes happen to tie break. So property number one, the common prefix property. In other words, our notation B sub K of G uh, is well defined. Any two longest chains can differ only in their last k blocks. It is, of course, the same k, right? So in the hypothesis, we're considering a leader sequence, which is 2k balanced. Um, and then in the hypothesis, we're saying that if you lop off the last k blocks of any longest chain, you'll get the same thing. So now let's move on to consistency and liveness. And again, for consistency, you know, in the super synchronous model, we're not worried about the different honest nodes being out of sync with each other. We're just worried about blocks getting rolled back. So the second property asserts that that can't ever happen. In other words, once a block has been finalized, once it appears in a longest chain with K blocks following it, that will continue to be the case forevermore. And finally, we have liveness. Uh, I'm going to prove the same version of liveness that we stated for the Tendermint protocol, namely that if a transaction at some point is known to all of the honest nodes, uh, then at some point that transaction will be confirmed. Okay, so it won't merely just appear eventually in the longest chain. It'll appear in the longest chain with K blocks after it. Okay, so this is the main result of lecture eight about longest chain consensus, saying that as long as we can somehow come up with a reasonably balanced sequence of leaders, then we're good. We are guaranteed to get everything we want, the common prefix property, uh, finality, and liveness. Now, you probably have um, two questions at the front of your mind. One question would just be like, why is the theorem true? Okay, it's kind of, you know, we, we argued that balancedness should be a necessary condition to get stuff that we want. How come it's a sufficient condition to get all of the properties we want? Common prefix property and consistency and liveness. So I will show you the proofs of all three of those statements, um, not in the next video, but in the videos after that. So in the next video, we're going to consider the case of randomly chosen leaders. Okay, so each round, each of the n nodes is going to have a one over n probability of being that round's leader. So hopefully, even in the permission setting, this seems like a not that crazy thing to do, right? We want things to be balanced. We want things to be sort of sort of proportionally represented in our leader sequence. So sort of random choices you might hope would more or less satisfy that property. Uh, but even more importantly, the case of randomly chosen leaders will extend really gracefully into the permissionless setting that we're going to discuss in lecture nine. 
And what we'll see in the next video is that randomly chosen leaders do, with high probability, uh, generate a reasonably balanced leader sequence. Exactly how balanced, you're wondering? Well, we'll talk about that in the next video, but, but just in case you skip it, you know, I'll mention that you know, it depends on various parameters. So it depends on exactly what fraction of the nodes are honest. It depends on sort of what duration of time you want to look at. Um, but, you know, if you just want to have some number for K in your mind going forward, you might want to think about the low double digits. So say, you know, K in the dozens. In practice, you know, depending on the, the sort of uh, value of the transaction in question, you may not want to wait that long. And so you do see more aggressive values of K being used uh, in some cases. Like famously, uh, for Bitcoin, the rule of thumb is to take K equal to 6. So that's the plan going forward. There's sort of five uh, relatively short videos left uh, in Lecture 8. Uh, in the next one, we'll argue that randomly chosen leaders tend to generate decently balanced sequences of leaders. Um, and therefore, sort of, you know, all of the conclusions of the theorem then apply to randomly chosen leaders. Then the next three videos, we'll have one for each of these three um, properties, common prefix property, uh, finality, and liveness. Um, and then we'll wrap up the discussion of longest chain consensus by saying, you know, what happens if we stress test it uh, using the partially synchronous model and compare and contrast the properties of longest chain consensus with those of the of the BFT type protocols that we studied in lectures uh, two through seven. So I'll see you in the next video to talk about randomly chosen leaders.